Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project. It's put on by the uh, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. and warehoused at the and warehouse at the Library of Congress and locally uh, conducted by Brian Powers who is one of our cameramen today here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library located at 9th and Walnut Streets in Cincinnati and today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a U.S. Navy man, a submariner, John Paul Wade and Mr. Wade, it's a pleasure to meet you, and is it all right just to call you John? Absolutely, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, the first question we ask is a real tough one, John, is your date of birth. <laughs> May the 13th, 1942. And uh, where, where were you living when you were born? We were living in, actually in Franklin. Franklin, Ohio. Everything was pretty much country then, Franklin, mm -hmm. Ohio, yeah. Which is north of Cincinnati, about, about 35 miles. About 35 miles, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, uh, were you living on a farm or in the city or what? We were living at that time when I was a baby and I, we moved shortly to Springboro after that, but it was a little house. Uh, then we moved to Springboro in a big old farmhouse, but it was just as a tenant, not uh -huh. Yeah. Did you live on a farm? Yes. I see. And what were your parents' names? My dad's name was Richard, and my mom's name was Marjorie. And what was your mother's maiden name? Duval. D-U-V-A-L-L? -L? Yes, as D-U capital V-A-L-L. -L. I see. What did your dad do for a living, John? He worked in an envelope factory. He started, after he got out of the Navy, he started as a broom pusher and ended up as a general manager of the small envelope factory in Dayton. In Dayton. What was the name of that company? Dayton Envelope. Dayton Envelope. Mm -hmm. Yes. And your your mom, what did she do? Uh, she worked in a laundromat for 35 years in uh, Kettering. Um, wait, year, yeah. Anyway, it was on Patterson Boulevard in Kettering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was, right. she, she got started by going there taking her laundry there and then she gradually worked and she worked for him for a long time. 35 years. Mm -hmm. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Two sisters. Yeah. Uh, one younger, one older. And what were their names? Older oh, one's okay. name's Pat or Patricia and the younger one's Nancy. Nancy. I see. Um, what about uh, your dad's parents? Did you know them? Your yes, I did. Mm -hmm. What were their names? Uh, Glenn and Elizabeth. And did they live there around Springboro? They lived in town in Springboro, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and your mother's parents, did you know them? Yes. And it was Earl and Fern, and they he was a, they, a tenant farmer. They lived on a in a tenant house on a farm just north of Springboro. I see. Uh, what church did you all belong to? Methodist Church Methodist. in Springboro. I see. And, uh, were you baptized there? I've never been baptized. Oh, I see. Okay. And um, what schools did you go to, starting with your grade school? Springboro. Uh -huh. I went to Springboro for 12 years. Oh, I see. And I went to Iowa State for a short period of time just to see if I wanted it bad enough to pay for it because I was told I would not get any help. And I didn't, so I joined the Navy. I didn't want to go that bad. Where was Iowa State at? What town? Ames. Ames, Ames Iowa. Iowa. Mm -hmm. Iowa. I had in my head I wanted to be a veterinary. And that was the number one veterinary school in the country at the time. I see. Um, and, and then I understand they have a good vet school in, uh, at Ohio State, too. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Did you play sports while you were in high school? Tried. Yeah. It <laughs> wasn't very good. Yeah. Too short and too slow. I see. But, uh, so you uh, you graduated what year? 1960. 1960, and then how long did you go out there to Iowa? Oh, wow. Well, I was trying to think. So, I, went, uh, I think I actually went out there about three months, did one quarter. Okay. And uh, 
when did, uh, what did you do then? When did you decide to join the Navy? In uh, September of 1962. You said you went down to NCR though first, didn't you? Well, I did. I, I you wanted my dad insisted that I get a job when if I graduated on on Sunday and went to work on Monday. I never had time to go interview for better jobs. So I was working as a carpenter's helper and a buck and a quarter an hour. And I finally had talked to the guy at NCR long enough to let him, he interviewed me and I started doing the test. And, and I was handy enough with my hands that he was pretty surprised. And then he gave me a math test and I had no math background. and. I did really well on that, so he said, sent me home and he said, go home, go back to work and I'll call you. Well, that night he called me and he called and left a message, you call me whenever you get back. So I went in the next day for a physical for a job. Mm -hmm. He had a job and it was like three twenty an hour plus 20 cent shift bonus. But I had to take their physical and I had a sprained ankle at the time and I didn't pack the physical. So I got kind of disgusted. and. Went down to the recruiter's office and said, let's do it. Wow. So you went down then, this is September 1962. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to join the Navy at? What well, city and location? Well, Middletown. The, okay. the, the uh, recruiter's office? Recruiters. Everybody was in the old post office. They were okay. all, you know, like now they're all together. But at that time they were too, but they were all in the old post office. Uh -huh. And what made you decide to go in the Navy, being in the middle of the United States? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, just that's just what I decided. I, I I can't give you a reason. So, after you went down to the recruiter, how soon was it that they decided to take you? He actually said, when I had told him what I wanted to do, and it was the nuclear power Navy was just starting, and they had a big banner that. I had a submarine with Uncle Sam saying, I want you, and I thought, that looks pretty cool, I'll just do that. And oh, he you got... You told him you wanted a submarine? Yes, and he got real serious then, and he said, when do you want to leave? I said, when do you want me to leave? And two weeks, I said, it was like Monday the 16th, that's a good day, I'll go. Then I went home and told my mom that I joined the Navy. <laughs> and what did your mother say? <laughs> you what? Well, that's 20 years old, you know, it's time yeah. to do something. What did your dad say? Nothing. My dad didn't say much of anything any time. Yeah. Um, Actually, I think he said, if that's what you want, and I said, I do. And what, ma what made you want submarines, though? Because that submarine, picture. The picture. Mm -hmm. I see. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm from Springboro, Ohio. I don't know what. <laughs> so then you joined actually on the 16th of September. That's the day I left. That's mm -hmm. the day you left. And uh, where did they send you on your first? To Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Now that's in Chicago, isn't it? Yeah, north of Chicago, right? Yeah. Uh, I can what they call it. Uh, Great Lakes Naval Station. Mm -hmm. and it's it's right on the lake, north of Chicago. Right. And uh, how long is, is is regular basic training there then? Oh. At, at that time it was nine weeks, but the nuclear power navy was so new that they had all kinds of tests. They gave me hearing tests, colorblind, uh, pressure, hearing, over and above what you got for your normal boot camp. So. All the guys, I was there like three weeks waiting for all these. So all the guys I went up there with already started boot camp. And then I, I got through all those tests and they sent me over to start boot camp. So I was up there about 12 weeks. <coughs> I see. Um, what was boot camp like? I, I That's a hard one to say because to me it was a a breeze. I, you know, I've spent my whole life bailing hay and 
boot camp was a breeze. I, yeah. I mean, it was it was hard. Right. All you got to do is keep your mouth shut and do what they tell you. Right. Yeah. Um, and what did you think of the, the, the chow you got in the Navy when you first joined? <coughs> they fed us things like dried beef gravy. I grew up on that. Everybody's complaining about it. I loved it. Uh, it was called it's, SOS. For yes, <laughs> yes I was, yeah. I always thought that was delicious myself. Yeah, I did too. I, I absolutely loved it. And the other food was, and I was a very picky eater at the time, but I learned that all that stuff really didn't taste too bad. So I never had a problem. I just ate it and kept my mouth shut. Did you ever have to pull KP while you were doing uh, basic? Only one time when I was waiting to get assigned to boot camp company, I had to go in and break eggs. For scrambled eggs in a big vat about this big around them. Yeah. Just breaking eggs. There's four of us breaking eggs in there. Did you make any friends while you were in basic? Of the 12 weeks that uh, you were No, Not really. I got thrown in with a bunch of people from New York. People that I, I did, had, I, I just knew nothing about them. And we were friends there, but it didn't carry on. Yeah. No. Now, it, uh, so you um, <coughs> you had three weeks of preliminary uh, testing, mm -hmm. knowing that you're going to go into submarines when mm -hmm. you're finished with basic training. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, anything else you want to tell us about your 12 weeks there before we move on? It's cold. Yeah. yeah. Cold. Yeah, you were there in uh, October. And, yes. Uh, in yes. November of 40, uh, 62. Yes. Yeah. And the snow goes this way. Right off the lake. This way, and it's cold, very cold. Right off the Lake Michigan. Yeah. And the only, I only got in trouble once, and I couldn't remember a guy's name, and I was getting ready to go on a dumpster watch, the Dipsy Dumpster Watch is what they right. called it. And I had the midnights, and so I was going out there in the winds, and had every piece of clothes I could get on. And I didn't know his name, so I had to do a hundred push-ups. So by the time I got out there, I was sweating. <laughs> I, I just got behind a dumpster and let the wind blow. I was just, you know, it was to teach you to stand the watch. Right. Well, stupid, but you know, it's like I said, it's dark and the wind's howling and it's snowing sideways, and who's going to be out there stealing that? Right. Well, when you're going, th that brings up an interesting question. You're in the Navy and you're, you know you're going in a submarine. Did you get rifle training or handgun training of any type? Very little. Very little. We always carried that old beat up rifle with it was plugged and rusty and you, you had to be careful, didn't touch anything because then you get gigged at inspection. But we went to rifle range one day and I think we shot the M1 and we shot the 45 one day. And that's it. Yeah. So we arrive now, let's say, at the end of your 12 weeks. Where do you go and what do you do? Uh, well, of course, you had had to leave, and, and I went home for oh, yeah, a that. few days and then back to uh, Great Lakes to go to A school, which was machinist mate. What do you call it? A? A school. It's your first. Oh. You know, when whatever rate you're going for, if you haven't, if you're on a strike or if you already categories at a rate, which I was, was the machinist mate, and A school, it was 12 weeks. If you wanted to be electronics tech, it was like 18 weeks. It just it depend on what you're doing. So what were you training to be at the 12 weeks? Machinist mate. Machinist mate. What is a machinist mate? <laughs> During the war, they called him a motor machinist. Uh, was where the MM came from. And engine work. Uh, my whole thing was in the engine room. I, I took care of the the whole engine room thing: pumps, turbines, reduction gears, uh, associated equipment. An advanced advanced mechanic. Uh, yeah, just a little a bit of everything. Mechanic. Yeah, advanced. just 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 a mechanic on a on a uh, power plant. I see. And you say that was what twelve weeks? Twelve weeks. Uh, are you promoted at any time during this? When you got out of boot camp, you were what they call an E1, and you had one little tiny stripe. You, you got through boot camp, you were an E2, which had two little tiny stripes. Mm -hmm. 
and it was that for a while and then then you get three little tiny stripes and, and you're either called a seaman or a fireman and I was a fireman because I was in the machinery okay and that, and you, you you had this schooling and uh, and attained that rank still there at Great Lakes yes that was an additional 12 weeks I think you said yeah yes yes it, so it, one of the greatest thing I, I remember about that is we made $38 every two weeks everybody had to get in this a lot of the buildings up there were old airplane hangers you all had to go in that building and they locked the doors and you had to go to this window and get your pay chip and you had to line yourself up alphabetically in two lines with being a W and I just head for the end and wait till they straighten them out you got this little pay chip then you had to go back around and reline up and they paid us in cash and I never will forget, it's a 20, a 10, a 5, a 2, and a 1. 20, 10, And five, the guy had one of them little rubber fingers, and he'd go. And they'd count it about three times and out the door. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I will never forget that. All, all according to regulations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but he had stacks of brand new, spanking brand new bills in these little bins. Now, while you're there, uh, you going through this advanced training uh, you do know that you're still going on the submarine yes are, are the other fellows that are with you do they necessarily going on the submarine no no nobody that I knew of at that time no it, you get funneled down to a very small group yeah. so uh, you, did, you didn't make any lasting friends there either I would suppose yeah, I did. A um, couple of guys that I knew all the way through the service, and I've lost contact with him now. Uh, but uh, I know he stayed in the Navy, but I, you know, I didn't. I kept. We kept up even for years. We both went to Pearl Harbor. We visited back and forth as families there, and uh, then I got out and he stayed in. So at the end of this 12 weeks of advanced training, uh, where do you go? went to New London, Connecticut for submarine school. Tell us about submarine school. Then. And <laughs> is New London, Connecticut an actual naval base? Absolutely. It's a, it's a big naval base, a big uh, it's right close to the shipyard up there uh, and it's on the Thames River and it's a it's it's just a, it's a big base. It's a submarine base and it's they have a lot of schools up there. Uh, you know, it's this we're talking 50 some years ago so mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what it, I think it's still a submarine base and mm -hmm. it's still you know it's still viable you tell, know. tell us about your training there then. it was just book things telling us what you're going to be looking for and what you're going to be doing and we did take a couple of what do they call school run school boats they, they, we would go in a submarine go out and uh, do some operations. So, in my opinion, they were just kind of checking to see if you could do it. Uh, but as far as the schooling, it was a breeze. I, I, you know, it was just no, no problem. How long was the schooling? Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Now, when they send you out on, on, I guess you might call them a drill, that you're on a submarine and you're going out to see how you handle it. Mm -hmm. Are those nuclear submarines you're on? No, no, no. Those were diesels. Nuclear was so new then, they only had, the only one really going at that time was the Nautilus. Okay. So they didn't, they you know, and you know, it was so new. Well, how did you react then? This is really the first time you've been on a submarine. First time I've been at sea. <laughs> I it didn't have any problem with it, so they gave me the green light and on I went. Now, when you went out on these test runs, how long did you stay down? You know, not very long. I think they, they went up and down a couple of times to see how you handled the the depth, the change in pressure. And the old ones didn't go that deep, so, you know, you probably went a couple hundred feet. Nothing, and you cruise around a little bit and then take you back in, and they're all watching you to see what you'll do. Mm -hmm. And like I say, the submarine school, there were probably 15 people in the class in the in the A school, there was probably a hundred, but at that time there were surface crafts. The diesel boats were just 
on their way out. You know, they, they were just used for like picket line stuff, picket. How many men are normally on a submarine crew? Well, the diesel boat, any, anywhere from 75 to 80. The nuke boats, the fast attack boat, which I was on, usually around 100. The boomers or the nuclear missile boats were more. I was never on one, so I don't know. Do you operate on a, on a two shift day or a three shift day? Three. On three shifts. Yeah. Four hour watches, eight hours off, four hour watches. So if you had the mid watch, which was noon to four, you you had midnight to four. So and if in between, if something needed repaired, you had to work to fix it till it. So are you on duty for four and then off? Eight. Eight and then back on for four. Yes. And that's rotated so that uh, in thirds. Yes. Um, so you're up there at uh, at New London, Connecticut for mm -hmm. nine weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, did you make any uh, lasting friends while you were there at New London? or people that you served with? Um, same guy. We kind of went up there together. Um, and there was a couple people, but I got sent to Pearl Harbor, so it was all, you know, not not oh. lasting, no. So, uh, so you finished there after nine weeks? Mm-hmm. And you had been out on a uh, regular diesel s submarine mm -hmm. a couple of times? Yeah, twice. And uh, what's your next uh, station? I went to Norfolk. Uh, I was assigned to the USS Carp, which is a World War II diesel boat that had made a couple of war patrols at the end, but it was, you know, it just came online at the end of the war. Uh, you know, it was just, just an old diesel boat. And uh, so, are you, tell, how often do you go out in the Carp then? Or did you? You know, I can't really. Uh, whenever they they would come back and say, "Well, we got to go out for uh, four weeks. We're going to go to San Juan, um, or we're just going to go out." I don't know. I'm in the engine room. I don't. I'm not privy to what and where. Right. I just again do what I'm told. Right. And they had a, a one of the big diesel engines. They wanted. They were going to overhaul. And they wanted me because I was five foot ten and weighed 150 pounds, and I can get in and out. And you're talking about a cylinder that's this big around, and we had to get in there and clean it enough to magnaflux it. Now, uh, were those diesels uh, produced by General Motors? Some were, and and you asked me. Uh, I'll think in a minute what ours were. They weren't General Motors. Fairbanks Morse. Okay. And uh, they were 16 cylinders and well, as long as those desks there. And, and how many of them were there? Four. Four? Two, at, two in the forward engine room and two in the aft. And uh, you, you know, they're, always, they're diesel electric, so you, you run the diesels to charge the batteries an electrical system so the screw is turned by electricity and you charge the batteries by running the the diesels now how, how <coughs> when you're on these uh, exercises or missions uh, how long do you stay submerged the diesel boat not very long because you would start running out of oxygen and this one was a later built and it had a snorkel which you could run at periscope depth with the snorkel mast up, it would bring in enough air to run those engines. You, if the tremendous amount of air they needed. Now you can't be very deep though uh, with the periscope. Oh no, no, you're just periscope depth. You're, you're just yeah. barely under the water, probably 60 feet. And how, how, how deep would you go in uh, one of these diesel submarines? They always told us in, in excess of 200, and I think three to four was max. Yeah, they, they didn't go. And that's the max on the safety line, so, you know, they had to figure 
all that stuff at the time I was in was top secret. You didn't tell anybody, so right. I never bothered to learn it. Right. Uh, Couldn't do anything about it anyway. When you're down there at two or three hundred feet, you know, two hundred feet is the same as five hundred feet to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what uh, do you hear any of these noises that you see and or hear about sometimes? Very rarely, but the ping that you hear, yeah, that'll drive you crazy if you're in a submarine. And if if the destroyer is pinging you, we know exactly where he's at. So it didn't happen very often. They, they would do it if you were on a. Uh, an exercise where you were the target and they're looking for you and they would come down and said we're going to send one ping because in that submarine it's ping ying, 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 ying. and what causes that ping what are they it's a it's a radar ping oh yeah, okay yeah uh, and you always hear it on them on the movies and right it don't have the only thing on the movies is the the diving alarm and the surface alarm and that's that is true but other than that, I've had people ask me, what could you see down there? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> there are no windows. <coughs> so, yeah. Um, well, did, did you have to walk in a scoop position, though, when you're going from no. place to place? No, only to go through the watertight doors. And they were about this wide and about that tall. And the bottom lip was about this high up. So you, you had to learn to step and duck and keep moving. How do you get oxygen in a submarine? That one, we just, you had surface. And uh, did all the World War II submarines traveled on the surface 90% of the time. The only time they went down is when, and if they got located by a destroyer and they were kept down over 12 hours, they started getting, and, and some of them went 24 hours and they were all most to the point where everybody passed out because the oxygen was gone, and they had to get up and open. Now, are there tanks that that uh, are under pressure, full of oxygen, or no, no? They're full of air for blowing the ballast tanks to get you up, or flooding the ballast tanks to get you down. But the oxygen is just what you take on yep. board, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it lasts uh, four hours for a hundred men. About twelve hours was. Yeah, I, I never was down that long on one. The, I was probably eight hours one time they were doing a, a fake attack on a carrier, you know, doing the, the war exercise. It's like putting a periscope up, though. It does have a shaft that the air... No, you have to do the, the snorkel to get oxygen. Okay, I was just... Yeah, the periscope is just to look and take pictures. Okay, I, didn't, I, I couldn't understand that. That's why I asked. Okay, yeah. snorkel mast is a separate mast, and it goes up, and it it has a um, clapper valve on the right. top. If any water hits it, okay. it shuts it down, and and you know that immediately because it just sucks the engines, and and they trip, of course. But just in the seconds, I mean, the the volume of air. Uh, if you left the door open to the head, which was right in front of that, they would pull the toilet paper out. <laughs> I, I just, yeah. it was my job. I had to clean it off the screens, but you just rub it and it goes on through. So, uh, and that all this time you're on the uh, the carp. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did you spend on the on the carp? You know, I don't know, six to seven months. Uh, and they, they, I thought later they had they just put me on there as a temporary to wait for the next nuclear power class. And as I found out later that I got qualified in submarines and it was a great thing because I got submarine pay all the way through the rest of it. And what, through all the schools and oh, like a hundred bucks a month. Oh, uh, over and above your thir uh, 68, uh, yep. 76, <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah. you're making 176 uh -huh. bucks a month and that's clear. Yep. <laughs> Plus you got three good meals a day. And yeah, four or five, whatever you wanted. You know, they had one every four hours. You could eat. <laughs> you could eat every four hours you wanted. And tell us about sleeping quarters on the submarine on the on the carp. On the carp, I I never had a bunk of my own. Uh, I was the lowest of the lowest grunts and a 
if I wanted to sleep, I would just find a bunk that somebody else wasn't in. And they had a, a green algaide cover over them when you were out, you zipped it up. And I would just crawl in on one of them and catch where he sleep till the guy that whose bunk it was came up. And he didn't. And uh, I had a place in the engine room, they, they, there was a catwalk outside of each one of them diesels. And we would store bales of rags back there. Because you know, a place to put them, and boy, they made great sleeping spots out of that side of the engine. It was warm. Warm. Yeah. 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 But I never had a bunk of my own on that sub. And uh, do you remember who your command, uh, commander was at the sub? At the car? No. No idea. What other places besides San Juan did you guys go? That's about it. That's, that's the only place we went. The only reason we went in there is because we had something broken and had to get apart. And then, no, I was, when I got on there, they were getting, they just came back from what they call a med cruise. And they were getting ready to go on another med cruise when I, when I left. So, so I didn't know. So you're living there at uh, Norfolk uh, Naval Yard. Or Naval I'm living in the but sub. Are you living in the sub? The whole time. You have to be qualified to get a place in the barracks. And what do you mean by qualified? Well, when you're in a submarine, you have to qualify. You have to learn. The object is to learn every system on the boat so that if you're a planes operator and you get killed, then I can step in there and operate the planes. Uh, or I can go check the batteries if electrician's mates killed. It was just so you had a working knowledge of everything on the boat, which <coughs> we did it. And then you had to go through a board and uh, the chief of the boat and a couple officers were there and they okay, quizzed you and they go through the boat and said, there's a little orange valve in here, what does it do? Inside that locker, well, you'd be able to tell them. If it got shut, what would happen? And if it was shut and got opened, what would happen? You know, uh, orange was oil, blue was water, forget what, and they had white and red, uh, yeah, I don't remember, it now exists, so what, but you had to know what, if you, if you turned one, what effect it would have on the ship. Actually, the boat's what they called them, but, you yeah. know. Uh, they call them a boat, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's good for history, yeah. Yeah, yeah so they're always called a boat. Yeah. But that's what would it mean to to qualify. So, like I said, and they they kept after me to qualify. It and somewhere, and I don't remember where I took it. I took the test for E3 and passed it. And then when I was on the carp, I took the test for E4, which is the third class petty officer, and I passed it. And. It was a good experience. I mean, it was definitely different. I, I mean, I was in the engine room. And I was soaked in diesel fuel all the time. Um, I, how much you? I, I had a, a story with that. When we got this thing all apart, there are 16 heads. They're about this big, a square, and about this thick, and they're steel. They weigh mm -hmm. about 90 pounds. And you got 16 pistons. We're this big around the the connecting rod. Just about that long. And then you pull all the cylinder liners out, which are about this big around. Well, I was told to get them topside, take them down the pier to the tender. So the first one I went down there, and, and submarines are nothing like the Navy. There's none of this spit and polish saluting and she said, good morning, Captain. That, that's it. He said, good morning, Wade, and you went on about your job. Uh, so I got this thing, and I got two hands. I got, and I got nothing, I, you know. And I got up the quarter deck, and he wouldn't see my ID. I said, "Sir, I don't have an ID. I just came down the pier from that submarine. I got to take these to the machine shop. It was on the third deck." Well, he argued around with me a little bit, and he finally let me on. And you remember, I told you I was just reeked of fuel oil. Well, I left tracks on his quarter deck, which is polished tile. Then I went up the steps, I got up there, and I went back down. When I got back down, it's polished clean again. I went back down, I got another one. I come back up there, and he said, 
you're not coming on my quarter deck. He said, you go back down on the pier and wait. <laughs> okay, what am I waiting? Anyway, this crane comes swinging out and this big basket comes down and he said, put it in there. Thank you, you saved my life. So, so all the rest of them went in there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, It was because I, I just, I made cracks of fuel. I just was sure. so deep into it and I didn't have to mess cook on the boat because I was the only grunt they had. They wanted to overhaul that engine and that's what I was there for. And the rest of the people, the crew, if they got in trouble, their extra duty, and it was written right on the thing, go help Wade. So if you, got, if you got four hours extra duty, you had to come and help me for four hours. So did you get qualified? I think that was the word you used. Yes. While you were on, on the, on on the, the car. car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you get to move into a barracks then or not? Yeah, for about two weeks. About two weeks. <laughs> Time to ship out. <laughs> Did you ever get any liberty down in Portsmouth? Yes, but not much. Again, you couldn't get it until you got qualified. You you, oh, you couldn't okay. leave the boat. So yeah. uh, no, yeah. I'm not a bar type person. So it really that didn't interest me. There wasn't much. You go down and there was a beer drinker. Didn't like it. So you know, I drink a beer with the guys, but. Yeah, didn't yeah right want. outside the gate, I guess they were. Uh, no, actually, we they went someplace. I, I couldn't tell you. We we went downtown to what they called the Strip. So, I never went over to Portsmouth. I mean, over to Norfolk. I was across the, the river there at uh, no, Newport News at Langley. Okay. Yeah, Newport News. Yeah. And Hampton. Yeah. 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 And I, w I never I never went in the bars either. I think I went in one once, but uh, yeah. Yeah. No. But uh, so <laughs> you were you got to go into the barracks for two weeks after you were qualified, mm -hmm. and uh, were you did you get orders for transfer? Were you expecting it, or did it just come sometimes? Out? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know when it was going to happen, but I knew I was slated to go to nuclear power school. To what? Nuclear power school. You knew that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you apply for it, or did you? Well, that was the whole designation all the way through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And where uh, did is that what happened to you now? You get yep. mm -hmm. and where's nuclear power school at? That the one I went to was in Bainbridge, Maryland. And yeah. where's Bainbridge? Uh, well, it's, a, it's in Maryland. It's on the coast, obviously. Well, no, no, no. Uh, it's no? inland from. Baltimore, Baltimore. We were here to kind of up this way is Baltimore, and um, I'm trying to think that you might know this. This was Boondocks. It was it was wild country. You, I never had any idea that that kind of country was in Maryland, but it was World War II boot camp. <coughs> and like I say, all this nuclear power stuff was so new, they refurbished some of the old barracks, and that's what we're in. And uh, Bainbridge. Yeah, Bainbridge. B a i n b r i d g e. I'm trying to think. Uh, they had it was not too far from the Chesapeake Bay, but um, it and, was a country though. Not yeah, not it was it, yeah, very country. Nothing, nothing around it whatsoever. No, you know. And what type of school and what were you learning there? They started us out with fractions and took us through calculus. You learned heat transfer theories. You learned nuclear theories. You learned uh, stuff that was useless. They just wanted to get you in there and get you the basic knowledge. Admiral Rickover was running the program then, and he right. was he was it was you were trying to learn as much as you could about the theory, and I struggled mightily. Um, just, I just, you know, I, I just had to really work at it. The theory of nuclear energy. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. What happens when you split an atom? What creates the heat? How do you, you know, how do, how do you provide <coughs> a nuclear power steam plant is, is exactly like a, a boiler fired plant. You're just creating steam to run the turbines. Mm -hmm. The nuclear power does it so much more quickly 
and I don't know about economically, but it's a lot cleaner. It's I don't know. I'm just well, you don't have any diesel fuel or any, no, uh, no. Uh, and what's the life of, of, of what is nuclear power? Is that a a capsule? Or is it what? I mean, it's a big water vessel, and they have these wafer thin, they call them rods, mm -hmm. and these all slide down into this water filled reactor, and the you raise and lower them to to create your output and and what is happening is the let's see the neutrons are bombarding the atoms the well I don't remember which, which one but anyway and the friction of these neutrons like this creates the heat and that heat is transferred to another system which just has water like a regular boiler and it causes that water to steam then goes through and runs your turbines your steam generators yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can regulate what it produces yes by running those drawings up and down by run, um, how close are you to these anyway, do you call them nuclear rods is that what you call them or what do you or just plain rods. Just rods. We know they're uh, we're they're they're all in a separate sealed compartment. They're all radioactive. We, yeah, yeah. So you don't. And it's all the shielding is keeping. I'm sure you get a little, but not very much, because it's this whole compartment is shielded with lead, thick lead to mm -hmm. keep that out. And when you go back there, you when you leave the front part of the ship, you go up and a walkway that goes through that, we call it a tunnel, and then back down to the rest of the ship. Uh, when you could, you'd cool it down when you go into port, so you could go in there. The radiation was at a minimum because you didn't have all the flying neutrons because you shut it down. Mm. And in the nuclear reactions that you hear about is somehow those things got uncovered and it started a uh, an uncontrollable fission it means it just got too hot and exploded. That's a, that's a basic something, you know. And I'm well, I've never had anybody explain it <laughs> that, that, that clearly before, but I think, you know, well, what about your exposure to radiation? Did you ever get tested for that? Uh, every every day, we had to wear a, a, a dosimeter in our pocket, which is kind of like a pin with a clip on it, and then we had to wear a uh, dosimeter on our belt, which is a little square just put on your belt, and wear it in. And then the corpsman would redose once a week and tell you what you had. So they register uh, radiation mm -hmm. and yeah. on a weekly basis. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, if you if you got if you were in a situation where you had to go in and clean in there, and you got a little bit too much, well then they'd shut you that you couldn't go in there anymore. You just said you had to stay out here to get the normal dose, which wasn't very much. And they, the military, cut it by. A factor of ten, you know, of what's safe for you, and then they they go down the line, and it was so far out there that, to my knowledge, I don't know anybody ever got sick from it. Now, did you have any special, you know, like you take a shower with soap? Did you have any special type cleaners or anything that you wash yourself off mm -mm. with every day? No, no, no. Well, a diesel boat, you didn't take showers because you didn't have any water. On a nuclear boat, you could take, you know, because we made, you could make water until you were on a station. If you were doing something, the still made too much noise. But if we were running between places, we could make 8,000 gallons a day, so you had one to do whatever you want. On a diesel boat, really the max, if everything was working right, make 600 gallons. 400 was for the batteries. The other 200 was cooking and drinking and so, uh, wasn't much. So, uh, so you had shower facilities. What about uh, sleeping accommodations on that nuclear? Uh, now, wait a minute. 
<laughs> we're not on a nuclear Soviet. You're still at uh, nuclear new, school. Nuclear the school. Nuclear power school. Yeah, okay. we kind of got ahead there. Yeah. No, no, no. You were explaining though what you had to learn. Mm -hmm. um, let's 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 continue there at school. If there's anything else you want to review with us, because that's yeah, no, like I said, I struggled mightily, and uh, when we were Are at the end, we had to take a final test. And I got like a two four nine, which wasn't good enough to pass. Well, they came out to us and said, someone in California stole this test. So we feel that this is compromised. So you have to stay here another two weeks studying while we make up a new test. And I passed that one and got sent on. So it was touch and go. Think it really happened, or yeah, it actually oh, happened. It yeah, it actually, yeah, they actually somebody actually stole the test, and and they just assumed, being naval guys, that it all got sent back to us yeah. on the East Coast, mm -hmm. which I never saw anything. But yeah, I got a second chance. So you passed. Got it. Yeah. 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 So then, after you uh, you have a ceremony and you graduate there, or no, no, they said here you go. Go up here. When so I went up to New York, uh, uh, drove up to New York, and then they had power plants up there that you learned to operate. Onshore? Yes, out in the country. Yeah. Okay. And it was, uh, it was really in the area of Saratoga Springs, Boston Spa, West Milton. It was in the country, way out in the country. And, um, we went up there and found an apartment, and uh, some of those boys we got pretty friendly with. But again, when I ended up going to Pearl Harbor, it just you know, and I didn't even know where they went. What was the point of you learning to operate a power plant? Just so you knew what you're doing when you got on a boat. In my opinion, that was much better than the nuclear power school. So the nuclear power school was six, seven months, and the learning to operate the plant was the same thing. And they had an isolated plant out in the country, and they didn't want us, they didn't want to turn Saratoga Springs into a military town. So we didn't wear uniforms. Uh, we were basically civilians, and you go out there and change your uniform, do your work, and learn how to run the plant, physically hands on. Mm -hmm. I was good at that. I got that first, but I didn't. So how long were you up there? About six months. I think it was seven months when I ended up. And um, where do you go from there? Well, since I had qualified to run the plant so early, so you had six months up there, I qualified to operate it in three months, so I had, in before you were qualified to run it, you had to go out there and spend four days, four hours studying, eight hours on the job. So after I got qualified, I only had to go eight hours, and the rest of the time was mine. And you work swing shift, you know, you go days, midnights, and nights. And after night, you got three and a half days off, and it was just very close to heaven. And when I got done, I got qualified, and they found out I was good with my hands. So they came and asked me if I wanted to go to nuclear or to stainless steel welding school back in New London. Okay. So I went to New London and I learned how to weld stainless steel. And I don't know. I think I spent nine weeks there, ten weeks, something of like that effect. Where are we at as far as the month and year when you're back up there? You got to be somewhere around 64, don't you? Well, 64 is when I went up to the nuclear power school. So I spent almost of that 64 in the nuclear power program, and then I went to uh, 64. So some sometime in uh, the middle of 64. No, let's see. Had to be in 65 when I finally got to that stainless steel, stainless steel school because I went up there in January of 
64 to the nuclear power school and you know up there and then mm -hmm. there so uh, it was late in 65 because when I got assigned to Pearl Harbor I had just about three years to go so we're into September there so September of 65 yeah I, yeah I finished up up there in August then I had a, a couple weeks leave at home before it's on my way yeah. do you have a romantic interest at this time a girlfriend or anything back home or, or? <laughs> I didn't when it all started uh, my sister had a girl that she worked with in the medical office and when I'm at home and leave, I just want to home. My plan was to go home, say hi, and this leave. This is 1965 or yeah. between fall. Okay. Yeah, this was uh, this was between the nuclear power training plant and the stainless steel welding. Okay. Okay. My intentions were to go back to New York. I, I knew people up there and lots of girls and so on. Well, my sister fixed me up with a blind date with this lady and it was I don't know April May somewhere in that neighborhood and we got married in September of 65 <laughs> actually August yeah uh, uh, yeah what did, what, uh, and what your what was your wife what is your wife's name Sheila Sheila and her mm -hmm. maiden name Ginter G-I-N-T-E-R she was from Middletown and she did she work at a medical uh, she worked for a doctor's office in uh, mm -hmm. in Middletown, mm -hmm. I see. And mm -hmm. you guys met in like June. Or? I gotta think it was more like April. I'm, I'm, those okay. months are all kind of yeah. clouded in there. I may have spent longer and on then that. You, then you're married by September. Actually, August sixth. August sixth. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw her for two weeks solid every day. She we met in uh, Niagara Falls for a weekend. She came up to New York for one of my buddy's weddings, and that's when I asked her, and she planned the wedding, and I come cruised it in in August, got married, and packed up and went to Pearl Harbor. So uh, August 6th of 1965, 65. and where'd you get married at? Uh, in Middletown. What church? Methodist, Methodist, Methodist Church, you know. Yeah. It's just one she had attended. Like I, said, I had nothing to do with it. All I had to do was buy these. I went to Navy Exchange, and. Thirteen bucks a yeah, piece. Yeah, uh, I'm quite familiar with that routine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and her maiden name was uh, uh, Gintner and Ginter, G I N T E R. G I N Ginter, G -I -N, Ginter uh, uh, Sheila mm -hmm. Ginter. And what her mom and dad do for a little bit? Uh, her dad worked at Armco, and her mom worked at Pennies. Later on in life, and she didn't. Well, she had four kids, so. And Sheila was a lot older than the very youngest one, so basically she took care of him while she worked. But she worked at Penny's in down Middletown. Would you guys go on your first date? I think we went to a bowling alley and had a drink. We didn't bowl. Just kind of getting acquainted and she was pretty hot, so there, you know yeah. so that was we've been married for fifty three years, so yeah. must have been all okay. Um, so after you're married on August the sixth of sixty five, you go where? You personally go where? Well, we both went. Okay. Uh, we each had a, a pretty new car. I had a 64 Pontiac GTO and she had a 64 Falcon convertible. <clears throat> we had to get rid of one of them, so my, actually my mom bought hers. We drove to California. Oh, you knew you transferred over? Oh yeah, I knew where I was going then, yes, yes. Uh, where were you going? Pearl Harbor. Okay, um, that's after the um, welding the stainless steel, steel. Mm -hmm. uh, welding, mm -hmm. okay. So you drive to California? In your 64 GTO. Mm -hmm. Where to in California? Travis Air Force Base. Okay. And Travis is outside of. Uh, mm, it's up close to Sacramento. Right. Um, 
What are you going to do with your car? They're going to ship it over there. Oh, is that right? Wow, you... I, dr I drove it down to the piers and checked it in and it's on the way. I see. Did you go to, uh, so you knew you were going to Hawaii, Honolulu? Mm -hmm. Did you go by that ship or did... No. We had, uh, you know, you, you got to understand there's two little hicks from Middletown, Springboro. We went, neither one's ever. The only first plane I was on, the one flew from Cincinnati to Great Lakes. But we were in a room about this size, and it was packed, crammed, and we're sitting there wondering, well, who, you know, how many planes they going to take? We all got on the same plane. It was a military air transport plane where they took all of the stuff inside and filled it full of seats, and off we went. And, you know, military match flight, what they call yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. You, that's a direct flight to uh, Hawaii. Then. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, you landed in Hawaii, so go from there with us and from day one on. Day one, oh, Lordy. Uh, well, when we got there, there was a chief off the boat there to meet me, but he didn't know that I was bringing a wife. So the paperwork never caught up to him, and he said, "Oh, well." I said, "I better I guess I better give this lay to her." Uh, they took us downtown and got us an apartment for the night, and the next morning I went to the boat, got introduced and around there. They actually, he came and got me because I had no idea how to get there. And then I run into a buddy that I knew there who was from Hawaii that had been met somewhere in these schools, and he said, I live in Kailua, which is across the island, in our, apart, our apartment building, there's an apartment empty. You want to go, yeah, because I don't know nothing about it. And uh, so the next day I said, I asked if I could get off because moving in, they said yes. Um, I borrowed his car, I went downtown, picked her up, and he said, just go down here and take the leaky, leaky highway across the island because Kailua is clear on the other side. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I finally stopped at a filling station. I said, can you tell me where the leaky, leaky highway is? He smiled and he looked up and he said, we pronounce that leaky, leaky. Like, like, L-I-K-E, L-I-K-E. Leaky, leaky, <laughs> not, not, not like like. So anyway, we, I went over there, went and got her and got over there, and we were in that apartment and we had to go to the Navy warehouse and pick out furniture to the warehouse they would, you know, we, we didn't have anything. And uh, then I went back to work the next day and I don't know, probably a week later my car came in and, and it was uh, just, it was going to work every day. Were you assigned to a submarine then? I was, I was assigned to the submarine before I left. I knew I was going to the barb. Okay. The barb needed a welder. They also needed a machinist mate, and I drew that card. What did your wife think about you being in a submarine? I don't know that we ever discussed that. Uh, well, she had to know that it was somewhat well, she dangerous, is yeah. the word I use. Yeah, but I don't know that she ever stay put. I'll get it. I don't know where it went. Uh, I don't know if that was ever talked about. I don't know where it went. It would be all right. Oh uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, she had to have some concerns. I, well, this is 1965, and yeah. and you're on a nuclear sub, and the thresher went down in 1963. This thresher went down when I got out of that A school. I was on my way to sub school. And my mother about had a kitten. At that time, I didn't know a whole lot of difference between diesel and nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And I told her, you know, that's the first one they've lost since World War II. I don't want to nuke. Anyway, I ended up on the Barb, which is a sister ship to the Thresher. Same exact model. The, the series of submarines, they called them the Thresher class. Mm -hmm. 
well, and the Navy in all their wisdom did not want to have a class of submarines named after a submarine that sank. So they took the next one, which was permit, so then they were permit classes. So Thresher was on 593, I was on 596, so it's just how close it is. And uh, what, was, what, what caused the Thresher to go down? They have lots of theories, and, and they, they came back on those subs and, and put in what they called a sub-safe program. The piping that blew the tanks to get the submarine up was not big enough. They couldn't put enough air in there quick enough to get it up. And it was going like this, and they couldn't stop it. That's, that's the accepted theory. Mm -hmm. It could have been anything from a fire that caused the reactor to scram, Reactor scrams, the rod slam to the bottom, everything shuts down. Your turbine shut down everything, and you got to go through this procedure to get it all going back. If you're hit it, you know, you may be. Did they ever recover the thresher? They didn't recover, but they found it. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, it was too deep to do any recovery. It's a, right off the coast of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. In well, they call it the Azores. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where it, uh, um, now it's shoals, and sh but I'm not sure where it went down. I was just curious. The, no, the uh, scorpion went down the Azores. Yeah, yeah the Azores are off of Spain. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was just curious, that, but it's too deep to uh, to even uh, practically try and raise To recover, yeah. yeah. And it was in pieces. It, it just imploded. But yours is an identical ship to that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, same. Yeah. But, uh, so they made they had to make corrections on your ship then on your boat. They they did not when I was there. It was something that came later, and they they developed this thing they called it a sub safe program, and it was they went in and redesigned the piping and so on so that they could blow those tanks quicker. So your mother was concerned, and uh, I'm sure your wife was yeah. too. You know, I, I don't know, they, they she came over to visit, my mom did, and they had what they call a dependent cruise. And they took families, whoever wanted to go, out to sea. In what? Which in, in the boat, in the sub. In which one? Uh, the barb. The barb. Yeah. They, they came on board, and I took them down to the mess hall, and got him a cup of coffee and set him down and said, I'll be back. I, I have to go to the engine room to get us moving. And uh, I came back up about 45 minutes later, and they're just there, sitting there talking. They both looked at me and said, when are we going to go underwater? I said, we've been there for about 40 minutes. <laughs> we've been under the water. So they did not have a feeling of being under the water. Now, of course, we didn't go to 1,200 feet, but... You know, yeah, they, they, underwater. yeah, they were underwater. Neither one of them knew it. So, um, it unless you really go deep, or you know, you come from deep up, you don't really know much. After you're on there for a while, you do because you recognize when your ears are trying to equalize. You know, if you go real, real deep, even though you're inside that submarine, you do feel the pressure, and because they keep pumping air in there to keep you know, the buoyancy. So it's, I, there's a lot, of, I, you know, I can't tell you all of right. it because I was in the back end of the ship and I pushed. I didn't guide, I didn't steer. Mm -hmm. I pushed as long as everything was working back here. So, uh, so your wife, did she get a job while you were in Hawaii? She had all kinds of jobs. She worked in a five and 10 cent store she cleaned house for a guy one time for a while and then she worked in the uh, hospital the mormon hospital over there in, in the uh in the baby what do you call them maternity ward yeah in the ward, yes uh so she had all you know she was and, busy yeah she didn't, wasn't a type to you know and like I said, we didn't have an idea who each other was. We, you know, you're just you're learning as you go. And when we went on the Westpac trip, she went home for like five months. And then she came back, and I don't know if she got any work. If she went to work after that or not. 
We had a baby then, so I don't think she went back to work. But by that time I was in E6, I was doing pretty good. And we, the Navy had rented, or the military had rented this huge brand new apartment complex in Waipahu. And when she came back, we got an apartment in there and, and it, was, it was super. And a big swimming pool down there and a laundromat. And every day the, the ladies would go down to the laundromat with the kids on the hip and the basket in the stroller. And, they play with the kids in the pool while their laundry is doing. And it was, most everything's open air out there, so, mm -hmm. you know, the, you had this big pool and then the laundry machines were right in there and you could see through there. And that was pretty. Well, let's go back to you. Um, you first got to Hawaii and your car is there. Um, and you're in the apartment on the other side, leaky, leaky. Uh, Tell me what you're doing now, what your duties are and what you're doing. You're assigned to the barb. Yeah, I'm on the barb, and I, I was machinist mate, so I was in the engine room, and I had taken the E5 test and passed it, so as, as E5 when I got there, um, and I, I still had three years left, and right at the, at the end of the time, I took the first class test, which is E6, passed it, so the last three years I was in there, uh, I was in E. The last two years I was in E6. Okay, I in the nuclear power, everybody was. You you didn't go in there in the in the surface navy and E6 is like God. Nuclear power world, it's nothing, because we all are. You're smarter than the normal. You're a little above the line, so everybody passes those tests. You know, some guys spent their whole life as a as an E3 in there. They just couldn't pass the test. Um, most of us never had any problem with it, so we're all E3, E5, and above. So, uh, but I was in the engine room, upper level engine room. I was the engine room supervisor for years. I, I all the time, and I was sent to uh, air conditioning school to learn how to fix the air conditioning. Um, we had a a big evaporator unit that was not your normal compressor type thing, and the com the old compressor type would not keep the boat cool. But this big evaporation unit, and don't ask me to explain it. It had something to do with it had to run on a vacuum, and, and it would cool the boat down. And our captain at the time did not like to be hot. And he, he said, you know, you go over there. And so him and I became buddies. <laughs> he, would, he would come to get me and say, my air conditioner's not working away. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll go, I'll go fix it. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. Uh, engine room, he, you know, he was always up front. And he wanted it cool. So it cool. And the berthing spaces were always shut. And the longer you were at sea, the colder it got. So when... You know, you didn't dally any time down there when you're getting ready to get in your bed. You got under got in there because it was cold. But uh, so, what um, what do you call it whenever you go on a tour somewhere or exercise somewhere? It's at sea. At, so when do you going go to sea? When do you go to sea there, and, and how many times? I, whenever something happens, I, I, you, you can go for a week and go two for two weeks. The longest time that I was ever at sea underwater was 75 days. We went to the North Pacific and snooped. That's what we did. That's We were um, observers, uh, espionage. Uh, it was the height of the Cold War. We were right, you know, we were right in it. Or we might go out for 30 days and find a Russian sub and track, follow him around, see what he's doing. Uh, but mostly we were espionage at that time. And what are you, what are you looking at? Are you, are you talking uh, about reading well, again, or, or again, visually sighting something? Or? I was in the engine room, no. But the sonar and the radar detection are so good, they have we would go up there and sit outside the Kamchatka 
peninsula, peninsula entrance yeah. is where they all came out and you'd take recordings and then you'd match it up with the recordings they had not me this is mm -hmm. the, the radio and sonar people right. identify the ship and you the, Ru the Russian submarines basically were assigned a box you know what size they were but they patrolled inside this box <coughs> and it, you know could have been thousands of square miles I don't know mm -hmm. but they didn't get out of them so if you knew who it was you might know where he's going they might they, they just kept track of all that stuff uh, and we might go follow him or we might just sit there and listen to see who else comes out and we were on patrol up there once and the the word kind of filtered back that something's happening and we don't know what it is so everything had come out of the harbor all the surface ship all the submarines everything like in a mad scramble well there was a Russian submarine that sank northwest of Hawaii there's many theories of what it was doing there it was not in its box it had three nuclear tip missiles on and like I said there's a lot of theories one of the one of the theories was that this Russian submarine was going to had been taken over by a bunch of Gestapo people not Gestapo what they call them anyway KGB KGB and they were going to go down and fire those missiles at Hawaii so they got down and they got into Chinese shipping lanes so their thought was we shoot these missiles and get out of here and they'll blame it on Chinese the Chinese and the Americans will fight we'll pick up the pieces that's just one theory we'll know but it was discovered by the University of Hawaii on their uh, C, C class, I don't know what you call them, but uh, they came across this place with excess radiation. And there was a big deal made about what it. What are they in, a, a boat? Yeah, they're just, they're... they're uh, a ship? Yeah, they're in a ship. Okay. And it, it's a... They're ocean, oceanic studies. Okay. I'm, I'm, the word don't come to me right now, but they found this place with the excess radiation. The Russians are looking all over for this thing, so we we'll get clicked in there and you know, we found it. Well, it was kept secret, 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 secret. And uh, Howard Hughes, they got him, to, he built a ship called the Glomar Explorer. Right. You, you, you might have heard of that name. <coughs> anyway, they built this thing and it was like a, a huge, Anyway, there was a big opening in the middle, it was just the ocean, and and they built this thing that they kept adding poles to it. Until they went down there a mile and a half, and they had this big claw, and they lifted that submarine up. It got almost up, and it broke in half. So they lost the rear half, went back down, and it was. In why they did all this, I don't know, because we already knew of what they were doing. Well, anyway, they pulled that up in there, and they found three bodies, and they buried them at sea with a normal funeral. And then the U.S. studied that ship till they, you know, but it was a waste of gazillions of dollars because they already knew all that they needed. But this ship, supposedly one of those missiles went off, and blew, blew the side out of the conning tower and they went down. It was a nuclear tip too? No, it was not. It was a diesel electric, but they had a nuclear weapons. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Russians knew that a renegade bunch of people took over this submarine? Those are, I'm, I, we, nobody knows for sure. They, they just observed some activity that wasn't, and they think these nine men went on there and changed the orders of of them and they they got out of their box and once they went out of their box the russians are looking for them well then in, the word came that it was that it sunk and then all hell broke loose and they don't know why it sunk uh, you, think, do, you think one of the one well that's they that's they brought it up that part they brought up the there was a hole in the 
They actually brought half a submarine yeah, up yeah. with this claw. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. They actually brought the whole thing up, but it got them almost the top. And because of you want to read a uh, to get a book, the blind man blind man's bluff, and he'll tell you all about it. And that's based on truth. Yeah, well, it is the truth. Yeah. Blind man bluff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and I didn't know this stuff until. 10, 15 years ago. Everything was classified when I went. You just kept your mouth shut. You didn't talk about anything. You just, mm -hmm. you know. Part of why they called it the silent service. We were told, you know, it's... But it was You can go in an excess of 20 knots. You can go in excess of 400 feet. It went a whole lot faster than that. It went a whole lot deeper than that. But it was... And, and thanks uh, to the University of Hawaii, uh, Mm -hmm. Oceanographic mm -hmm. uh, study. Oh, there you go. And this is one thing I can't figure out this, but the uh, the oceanographic part of the school got a big brand new ship. Everybody was sworn to secrecy. And it... it Afterwards, you mean? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Right then. And it was secret for all those years and now all this, this stuff is being declassified and all these guys are in there digging around and... Did they get the brand new ship before the discovery or after? After. After, okay. After. And Howard Hughes is the one that built the Glomar? Glomar Explorer, G-L-O-M-A-R Explorer. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's why these interviews are so interesting. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't think I had anything to tell you. So, oh, you, you yeah. told, you've actually told a lot here so far, uh, and I think you've done a remarkable job of explaining a, a complex subject, generally for me, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, well, and you did 25 years ago, I couldn't told you that. Yeah. So you spent 75 days underwater. Yes, sir. We went under in Pearl Harbor. We came back up in the exact same place. Kamchatka, that's all up there towards Vladivostok, isn't it? No, this, this is, Vladivostok's up here, Kamchatka's down here, and then uh, uh, sea or whatever, and then yeah, north, uh, right off the northern sea of Japan. OHK. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 like, like yeah. Oshkosh, my gosh, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah we were, yeah, we were up off the coast of Vladivostok that time, mm -hmm. that, that, when that long patrol. And we were supposed to go 60 days, what we were slated for. And they sent, we were always on radio silence. So they would go up every morning and they had this five mile long wire they ran out, floated and we would get the daily orders. From a floating wire? Yeah, but we didn't answer. Uh, and we got word to stay out another 30 days. By that time we were totally out of any kind of fresh food. We started on canned food and didn't like that pretty much. And I ate so much fruit cocktail. I think it was 30 years before I ever ate, ate fruit cocktail out of the right out of Navy. But they said stay 30 days. And oh God, you know, and about 70 days they said abort the mission, head home. And the captain said, he came on the speaker, <coughs> and he said, we've been cut short. He said, all ahead standard, due south. And we went as hard and as fast as we could go. He said, if they change their mind, I'm gonna be way away from where we were. So we went to about four days, we came all the way back. To Honolulu. Yeah. <laughs> he said, they ain't gonna catch me out here. So, yeah. uh, so you guys were running out of fresh food, but then, yeah, oh, they had mountains of canned food. And, and how many men again were on the farm? I think at that time there were, were 105 maybe, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Now you bound and made some friends on the bar. I did, uh, I did. Um, I, uh, I ha I've got a friend in Washington. I stopped by to see him and we went to Alaska. I had a buddy in Chicago, he died and a buddy in, Na in Knoxville, and he died. So I told Dave out there in Washington, I said, be careful. <laughs>
Be careful. You know, the guy in Chicago was an assistant uh, police commissioner, and he was fit, but he had had a bad heart. He had a bunch of bypasses, and we were getting ready to go. He had arranged for us to go on a cruise down in the Bahamas. We were going to rent this big catamaran, and he was a licensed pilot, and we were going to spend the week just in... His wife called me and said he had a little something with his heart, and they said he wanted to get it done now. And he went and uh, and died. Never made it out. Mm. And uh, what was his name? Uh, Charlie. Uh, you asked me. I got it mixed up with a friend that got home. Uh, Charlie Robbins. Uh, Charlie Roberts. Charlie Roberts. Yeah. An assistant police, did you say, commissioner? Or? Yeah, he was, it was a police commissioner. You know, mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, big guy. time. Yeah, he yeah, was real guy. sharp. Yeah. And the other guy stayed in the nuclear power business and, and helped build nuclear plants. He got leukemia and then he had a heart attack and just went on out. So the only one I really have much contact with is was the boy, is the boy in Washington. And uh, what's his name? David Vance. David Vance. Mm -hmm. um, so you come back after this 75-day cruise, and uh, a cruise, is that the right word? Mm-hmm. I don't, I... Yeah, that, well, we never did call it that, but um, they just sent you... Tour. Yeah, and they sent you tour. a notice, they report we're going. Now this is, this is you're, you're in the, uh, really, 1966, 7, and 8, that's when Vietnam is going hot and heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went over there and did a, because uh, you see the, ooh, I get the Vietnam medal. Um, we did a couple of patrols in the Gulf of Tonkin, I mean, because we couldn't get in too close because it's too shallow. But they consider it being in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And we just, and I don't really know, again, I'm an engine room. I wasn't privy to what went up, and I didn't ask anybody because I didn't, I, you know, it just, I just didn't, and I did my job, and sure. uh, like I said, I was in the inner engine room, I pushed, I didn't guide, I didn't, you know. So. You didn't surface while you were there? Oh yeah. When we went to, on that Westpac trip, we went to Yokohama, we went to Hong Kong. What's Westpac mean? West Pacific. Okay. Yeah, everything is yeah. abbreviated, but it's yeah. called a Westpac, right. which that one patch on there is which patch is this it? one right here yeah what's it, uh, while we're doing these patches and I'll jump back here to Westpac yep. but this is Westpac what is it that was the uh, reactor plant in Saratoga Springs that we trained on them it was right. called D1G it was actually a destroyer thing but we that's what we learned to run uh, and this, this is just the ship's patch for the barb barb 560 mm -hmm. 596. Yeah, and this one was just somebody made that up for the for the M division, which was machinist and division, yeah. And this is your first class crow. Mm -hmm. We call them crows. Okay. I think it's supposed to be an eagle. Yes. Yeah, and this is just some patches I had. And these metals here. This is this good con good conduct. Uh, National Defense Medal in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Mm -hmm. These are my original dog tags, yeah. and these are the what you get when you qualify. Those are called dolphins. 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 Okay. And those are like wings to a yeah, flight a people. Yeah. Yeah. Pilot. yeah. Yeah. And it's very, you know, when I when I got home, I I just never said anything about it because it was a very unpopular time. The war in Vietnam was going on and. You just didn't say where you've been. Mm. I went to work, and until the last five or six years, I was really never mentioned. And I got interested in it. Started back in. I was always proud of what I did, but yeah. you know, when I see well, things are going on, I'm super well, proud. So, uh, you and your wife are both in Hawaii, and uh, she's got good duty. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, how many children did you have in 
Two boys. Two boys? Mm -hmm. And what are their names? Let's don't go there. Okay. And um, I can't talk if you do. Okay. Um, so how long did were you were you there in Hawaii then? Almost three years to the day. Almost. I got I I got over there in early September and I got out. I I left there. I was actually discharged 65. the 16th, but I of September, but I spent. I don't know, a week or so in, in uh, Travis Air Force Base. When you come back. When I came back, because you got to go in and get your physicals and get everything checked out, and you got to get, you know, the, the legal part has to get you, check you out. The, the Corbin have to check everybody. It's just like so, checking out of the hospital. So you did six years active duty. Yes, sir. Yeah. Five years and eleven months and twenty-eight days. <laughs> okay, and you couldn't remember. Says so right there. You couldn't remember a date <laughs> well, ago. I'll remember all those things. Those are things that are very important. Uh, did you bring your GTO back with you? That's what I was waiting on there in, in California. But I had uh, Don't you wish traded you it. I had a nineteen six. Oh, I would like to have that sixty four right now. Oh, that's a six figure car that's, now. You're yeah. not kidding. The six, the sixty six that I brought home. Probably yeah, as close to that. That's reduced down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was, first one was gray, and the one I brought home was red. Um, um, you brought the original one back, the 64? No, no. You it's got rid it's of over, over in there? Hawaii somewhere, yeah. Okay. Where'd you buy the 66 at? In Hawaii. And you brought it back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, didn't, I needed new tires, and I didn't have enough money. So I went down and traded the car in for two dollars more a month. Yeah, I got that. You know, I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I understand you're surviving. That. Trust me, I understand that. I sold cars for forty-four years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, you come home and you have two sons, then, mm -hmm. and you and your wife are in California. Actually, we had one. One. One son. The okay. second one was born here. Okay. Uh, so what? And I, I think I can handle it. The oldest one's David. The youngest one's Jason. Okay. And he just okay. passed away. Oh, okay. Now, um, so you and your wife, are, what are you going to do? You're in California, Travis. Are you going to come home or essentially? Yeah, we. Uh, Middletown or? I had 60 days leave, so I got paid for that. Uh, you know, it was the money we had. And we took off for home. We toured. We went through Yellowstone and uh, and and you know, basically came home. Um, Why, when we've got all that money invested in you and you're proficient on a nuclear submarine, then you get, I just you let us get a return uh, on our investment. Yep, yep, you got three years. Um, that's a good question, and I didn't, as being that young, I didn't think about that much. My uncle, who was a favorite person that I grew up with, um, had started his own insurance agency, and he just wrote me a letter and sent me a book, and he said, study this, I need help. I don't know, you know, so I did. When I got home, I, I went to work for him. I, I passed the insurance exams and, and did that for 45 years. And I ended up, he died young, and I ended up, him and his son and I bought the agency, and, and it turned out to be a goodbye. I mean, you know, and six years ago, I just said, I don't want to do this anymore, and I told him. And so you were you owned an insurance agency mm -hmm, then for 40-some mm -hmm. uh, years? No, I, I just worked there probably, I can't, I can't even remember, well, Ralph died in 79, so somewhere around 80 or 81 is when we bought oh, it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. When you say we? This, my cousin and I, his, uh -huh. actually the uncle's son, mm -hmm. I, I was there, I started to work there when he came out of college, he started to work what there. What was the name of your agency? Uh, Ralph E. Wade Insurance. Okay. He, he, he'll know, he knows. Yeah, um, and where was that located at? Springboro. Springboro. 
And uh, so my whole life, other than military, was in Springboro. Now, when you came home, did your wife continue working, or did she went right back to work for the doctor? She'd worked, you know, she probably fifty years with him. What doctor is that? Uh, his what? name's Doctor Hammond, Jerry Hammond. Jerry Hammond. He was a general practice guy, and he was just he's just one of those super guy. Just she went right back to work for him, and she worked for him until he got out of practice. You uh, you said that I think what earlier we were talking, and you said that you had a couple of granddaughters, but no great. No, no, yeah, no they're, great grandchildren. They're, they're, I don't think they're they're uh, they're not real tuned to that one. And what's her name? Uh, Chloe is the oldest one. She's twenty three, and Allie is twenty. She's finishing up her junior year at Bowling Green. Chloe graduated from Bowling Green. She now works for a. A remodeling outfit in in Columbus. She's the her specialty is ev events organizing. So she's she organizes their shows when they go to different places to demonstrate their, their stuff. And you know they remodel bathrooms and do windows and stuff. Your wife's still in good health. Yes, meaner snake. <laughs> no, she's real good. She actually she still works part time in the insurance office. When she retired from the medical thing, uh, one of the secretaries got hurt in an auto accident, and she said she would work part time for the life and health guy. I, I never got into that, and she's been there ever since. But she goes when she wants to. And you know, she she likes it. She likes getting ready to go and gives her a little bit of spending money. Uh, Pat, um, we've progressed a pretty good distance here on our interview. I, I wonder if you have any questions. Well, I don't. I don't think uh, John, you told us what you were doing between your quarter out at uh, Iowa State. Uh, when you enlisted, uh, what did you do then? Did you go back to carpentry work? I went back to the carpentry work. And what did what were you building? What kind of project uh, did you do? It was a uh, back at that time you would probably call him a handyman. Whatever, we built room additions. We uh, repaired, uh, replaced siding on old houses, fixed the gutters, the old box gutters on old houses, replaced the fancy trim. Cabinets. It was actually called a cabinet shop. We built custom-made cabinets. Uh, but just anything anybody wanted us to do. Uh, what was the name of the company? Fred Wade, and he was a distant, distant relative. And I had uh, when I was working on the farm, he had built a, a room addition for Ralph, and. I had was working around there and he saw me and liked the way I work so he asked Ralph us what's he doing when he and then I you know one thing led to another and then I graduated on Sunday and went to work Monday. I have worked all my life. The la the only the last six years is nothing. So you were telling us about your experience uh walking uh on the Chiefs uh uh, flooring with your uh, diesel tracks. Uh, what did you do to clean up so that you could walk on them? No, he, they used the, the baskets after that. Yeah, I never had to go back on there. What did right. you do to clean up? How did you get the diesel cleaned up off of you? Uh, you? You just, I wore it. You know, and I would have to change clothes because the clothes I was in, I, I'd change everything to get and then take a shower. And it was really good when I got to go up to barracks because I could get a good shower and get it off. But I didn't have as much then as time went on, but that was only when I first went on there. But I didn't clean that quarter deck. He had somebody else do that, and he wasn't about to let me make tracks again. And you've got about 100, 100 to 105 men on this submarine. Uh, what kind of sleeping quarters did you have? Did you have to share the same bunk? No. The the nuclear power subs had enough room for everybody got their own bunk. And no, I had my own. I had a that one picture is 
Yeah, the smaller picture. It's it's actually taken. I'm standing beside the yes, bunk, and yes, there, I remember that, there yeah. the one is shoulder high. There's right. another one down this far, and then there's one down lower. And I had that lower one, and it was perfect. Were they spread out throughout the submarine, or were they? No, most of them. Several of them were down in that, and it was a lower level, right off the torpedo room, and then the whole front portion of the boat was berthing compartments. How many torpedoes did you carry? Oh, Lordy. Uh, you know, I don't know. I never went in there and counted them. We used to go in there and play pinochle on them, but the torpedo men were always fooling with them, but no. I never. Did you have any other armament on the submarine besides the torpedoes? No. No. And it, some of those were nuclear tipped, like, you know, they. Um, are they missiles or torpedoes? Torpedoes. Torpedo. We had no missiles. We were on what they call a fast attack, which is a smaller boat. The missile boats actually, in the middle, they added this huge missile compartment, and uh, we just didn't have that. So you had nuclear tip uh, torpedoes mm -hmm. to fire at other ships or whatever. I mean, you did that with those things, you didn't even have to hit them. You said to get close. Yeah. But you wouldn't have had any land targets. No, 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 we would not have. You, you might have had harbor targets, but you would have never had any. You know. I, see. I, I have a story. This I got about the torpedo tubes. This bong that I picked out because I was an E5 when I got there, so I had. They said, "Pick your bong." So I went around, I found it, and it was the torpedo tube went on an angle right beside it and what was there was just a little thin metal wall and the first time we went to sea I'm in there and I'm asleep and I heard this god awful racket uh, bang and clanking and I come out of there bouncing around banging your head and the torpedo men are always standing in the door down there laughing at me they fired a what they call a water slug testing all the equipment and oh my God, it's just, you know, scared me to death. And they're standing there laughing. But I mean, that moved up and, and put it on me. And after that, it never even woke me up when they would do it. But boy, that first one was a uh, dandy. <laughs> anyway, that's a little funny thing happened. Well, do you have torpedo tubes fore and aft on the no. boat? No. Just forward? Forward on, on the, the new boat. The old diesel boat had fore and aft. But. Uh, our job was just the, the, they called it the hunter killer group. You find them, kill them, go. I mean, we never had to do that, of course, but that was the, it was fast and it would go deep and that's what it was, what it was for. When were you, when you were out at sea, were you mostly by yourself, uh, no other ships around you, no other boats around you? Yeah, because we were just doing the es espionage trick up there listening and nosing. And I, I don't know that there was maybe another one around somewhere, but we couldn't radio communicate because anything you did that would alert the Russians, so we did none of that. Now, other times we did. In fact, uh, we were out on off of Pearl Harbor checking things, and we had a uh, collision with another nuke boat. And it just happened that we were they were coming this way and we were going this way. And we clipped them right in front of the sail, like this. And we went to the surface. We had no idea where they went, but they did get to the surface. Everybody was okay, it wasn't no big deal. But it says there's places in the water that you cannot hear. They're called uh, temperature gradients. And you might run through a level of, of water that your sonar won't pick up something behind you or whatever. It, you know, it was a big investigation, but it just something happened. You know. How much damage was done? Uh, it dented our front end and knocked the sonar uh, dome off, and the Sargo was pretty well. I mean, it was really close to, you know, another foot. They'd have gone down. And what was the name of that? Sargo. S A R G O. G O. And mm -hmm. that's called a temperature gradient? Yeah. Yeah, they're just levels of water. 
just and, just and like the sonar a, doesn't work in the, right it, it gets distorted and so we should have known they were that close to each other but yeah. wow didn't that's a close call I would say. yeah very 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 but in inside all you felt a bump I was back in the injury room and I feel a bump boom and my, both of you surfaced there yeah where were you at right off the coast of Hawaii oh okay you guys went out there to do the deep water tests the things happened you'd you'd go down to test all the valves of machinery because there no bottom out there and uh, that was where it was all done okay did you have any interesting experiences on your 75 day uh, espionage cruise that you're able to tell about anything unusual not that I know, except running out of fresh food. You know, the milk and the, we had eggs, you know, they, they talk about keeping your eggs. We had eggs stored in the engine room and them gross cartons, you know, mm -hmm. you're walking on cartons of canned goods and you just, other than that, really, no, it was just get up, go to work, go to bed. And, and when you're on a patrol like that, if you weren't working or you weren't on watch, they wanted you out of the way so you know mm -hmm. you, you couldn't that's why I say we used to go pay peanut on torpedo room because every four hours they would set up for a meal uh, I was going to ask you about that everybody ate in shifts mm -hmm. cool. and you picked the one you wanted to go to you went four eight there. four eight yeah yeah uh, usually kind of hungry when you got off watch uh, if you were up at midnight, they had what they put out what they called mid rats, which is uh, sandwiches, sandwich meat, sandwich type fare. They always had coffee, lots and lots and lots of coffee. How many guys did you have cooking for you? I think there were three cooks and one what they called a mess cook which was, in my opinion, a horrible job. You were on call 24 hours a day. You did all the cleanup. You did the, every scut thing had to be done in the kitchen, you did it. And usually that happened to a uh, non-committed or what they call a striker. He didn't have anything. He wasn't striking for anything. And he came on and usually he had the rating of a bosun's bait because that's, that's a kind of catch-all for that and he just, so I think there were three in, in the mess cook. Did officers eat in a different put area? Than yes, they, they, they ate the same food, but it was taken from there over into this little area and the stewards, who are like manservants, served them. And um, yeah, they ate in the wardroom. Yeah. which the wardroom had a, a table like that and it had about this much room on all the way around it that you could slide in there and but that's where they ate um i wanted to before i forget i want to ask when you're you're in uh, hawaii in honolulu during the height of the vietnam war mm -hmm. right right during tet offensive and things did the people treat you in a derogatory manner in in Hawaii like they did in the United States servicemen when the servicemen come home? No. Uh, but we weren't around them a whole people. When you went out to dinner, you were dressed in civilian clothes. When I went to work, I went from, we lived in Waipahu then, I went from there down to Pearl Harbor you went home, you were around all different kind of service people. So there wasn't a whole lot of mixing with, so I don't remember any, uh, I don't remember any bitterness or. Okay, yeah. or any negativity. No, no, not, not like the here. What about when you came home? Well, I learned pretty quickly, you just didn't say where you been. You didn't say what you did, you just, or what you were doing. Uh, was very unpopular and they didn't separate between soldiers and they just right. hated the military so you know because you know things happened that you know were you uh did you have any racial problems while you were in the military no 
no, we had that really. We didn't have any of that men. We we had several blacks. Uh, in the Philippines, they were still. So when this the submarine thing started, the, the blacks were only stewards. Stewards. Well, then they came. You know, they came. They they were smart fellows. They started striking for electrician or machinist made or cook or whatever, and most of them made it. Uh, one good friend of mine was was. Uh, he was auxiliary man. He did the same thing up front that I did back. He was a machinist mate, but he repaired things. And, and I, as far as my needs are, no, I, did, I had no, you know, they mm -hmm. did their job and went on. Right. Well, what did these stewards do when they're not serving the officers their meals? Yeah, I don't know. But they, you know, every four hours they're doing the same thing. They're yeah. preparing something in there and cleaning up. And uh, they didn't even have a facility to cook. They had coffee pots and that sort of stuff. And they came out and got the food. But they cleaned up, did the same, you know. Uh, I assume they washed the dishes. I don't know. I never had to do it, so I didn't pay attention. Well, Ray, that's all I have. Uh, thank you, John, for doing this for us, and uh, yeah. thank you for your service. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate it. And well, I, thank point, you. I want to thank you so much. Uh, you made it. You made it where I can almost understand it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> thank you so Good. much for this Good. interview, and Good. and I want to thank you for your service to our country too. Thank you. Well, did you do? You were there, right? Yes, you sir. did. Yes, thank sir. you too. Pat was the only draft dodger. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs>